Quest number 141, Spirit of Summer. At the edge of the wilderness ditch, we find a spirit of a young girl. She beckons us to go with her. We follow her and end up somewhere deep in the wilderness. All of a sudden, we're pulled into the spirit realm. We see a bunch of spirits having conversations, but can't hear what they're saying. One of the ghosts puts some sort of barrier over the girl. We try and talk to her, but she won't speak. We try and talk to the man, but he can't hear us, or at least it doesn't seem so. He's gesturing at us. We cheer back at him, but that doesn't seem to work. We watch the other two spirits communicate, but they seem to be... Wait, did you see that gigantic thing over there? What was that? Um, well, we watch the two spirits and copy what they're doing. The barrier disappears. There's that thing again. We ignore it and talk to the girl. She's barely able to tell me that the father is trying to, but needs help. Beast? Souls. The village west of here in the mountains? She wants us to speak there. We blink and arrive in a new area. It appears to still be in the wilderness, but there's a cursed magic tree and a diseased limpwort. We ask where we are. She says it used to be a little village, and she used to come here to play with her friends. She goes on to say something about devouring and being broken, but we don't understand. We ask what we can do. She tells us to wash and clean something and fill a barrel. We have to be taken back to the corporeal world and realize we're in the ruins of the bandit camp. The patch where the limpwort was in the spirit realm is full of weeds. We see a full barrel of water, and the magic tree is a stump. We find a limport seed in a crate, and then a seed dipper. Wait, where's the rake? There's supposed to be... Wait... Oh, man. It's in the wall. Looks like Jagex missed this in the wilderness overhaul. Can't even telegrab it. Well, let's pretend it does let us grab it, and just use the one on our tool belt. Seed planted. We take a hammer and planks and repair this wardrobe as well, while we're waiting. May as well make this place look a little nicer. We also take the water out of the barrel and put it into a bucket. Now we wait 25 minutes. After the limpwort grows, we head back into the spirit room. The barrel that was empty before is now full of water. She washes her face in it. The limpwort plant is gone and there's a doll in its place. We take it, or try to take it, and realize we never actually picked it up. Weird. We ask the spirit what we can do now. She says she's hungry and misses the good meal snack or something. We head back to the real world and find some mushrooms. We pick them and go back to the spirit room and she's able to pick them herself and eat one. Huh, we see the mushroom in her tummy. She then changes her clothes in the wardrobe and takes a doll from the patch. All of a sudden, she thanks us. She says we've restored her soul enough for her to communicate. We ask if that's all she needed, but she says no, this is just the start. She asks us to follow her back to the farm, and she introduces herself as Summer Bond. She used to live here with her parents, Jenica and Eric, and the two farmhands, Jellek and Marinek. Her mother died, and the rest of them were murdered, just after she turned six. We ask who did it, and she says it was a group of men, but she can hardly remember her life. Now, though, she's suffering far worse than she could have in life. We ask her what's going on. She tells us she's been stuck here with... the Beast. It forces them to stay here as spirits as it slowly drains the life out of them. They're in constant pain, and the beast grows stronger by the day. She brought us here so we can find a way to help. She says Jalak discovered some discs that can channel and concentrate newly summoned soul energy. We ask where they are, and she says they're hidden and to sleep. We have to use an altar to awaken them. She leads us downstairs into the room with the altar, and she says we'll need to sate the altar's hunger by feeding it the remains of the dead. We head back to the real world, grab a bunch of bones, go back to the spirit realm, and fill the slots in the altar. Next, she says we need to bring the disc's newly summoned souls. We tell her sacrificing souls to save her family's souls doesn't really sound right. She says the discs only borrow the soul energy, not consume it. We find a disc with a wolf image on it and summon a spirit wolf. The beast devours it. Summer says we need to give the spirit to the disc before the beast devours it, but while it's still close so it can hit it. We summon and dismiss another wolf, and the disc hits the beast. Another disc appears, and the beast shoves us away. We see this one has a desert worm image, so we repeat the process with that. It shocks the beast, and a third disc, this one with a scorpion image. The spirits come and entrap the beast over the disc after we shock it again. And they thank us, but they tell us that our presence here is strengthening the beast at a rapid rate. All of them may have recovered, but there's nothing they can do to stop the beast from feeding on them further. Summer disagrees and says they must fight, but they all believe it's meaningless and in vain. She gives us her mother's ring, which should let us enter the spirit realm at will, if we find a portal. And it'll also help us get more loot at Revenants. All of a sudden, the beast thrashes, and Summer sends us away. Quest complete. As we're brought to safety, we can feel the earth shake. How is that possible if the beast is trapped in the spirit room?
Back in 2005, we helped a man named Joral protect an outpost in West Ardoyan. The outpost was going to be turned into an alchemy lab, but we proved it had significant historical importance with the first king and the leaders of Kandarin. During the quest, we also found an enchanted key that seems to act as a hot and cold proximity detector, which led us to treasure. Quest number 142, Meeting History. We visit our old friend Joral in his outpost. He says he found some papers talking about the enchanted key we found. He gives us a copy of them and says that notes mention to not carry anything but the key. He banks all of our items for us and we read the notes. Eureka, I've done it! The key now returns to its origins. It really does get hotter and colder depending on your proximity. So strange. Its other special function only seems to work north of the river. After smelting it, I bound it with the words, Pradum Abducto. Good words, I think. They have a certain ring to them. We try and smelt it, but can't really figure out how, so instead we just follow the key's temperature, find the place where it's most hot, and rub it while saying the words. Here goes nothing. Pradum Abducto. Hmm, nothing's happening. What? Where am I? We find ourselves in some sort of farm with a barrier around it. The river seems to be the same shape, but there's no bridge. We head into the fence area and, oh, that kid is banging runes together. Cool. There's also a woman working on a shed, a dog, and a man trying to calm down a crying baby named Sarah. We talk to the woman, who's completely startled by us being here. We tell her we were just outside of Ardoyan Castle, and she says she's never heard of it. We mention Lumbridge, Fallow, and Varrock, but she says she's never come across any civilizations here. We ask if we're in RuneScape. She says, of course we are. We figure out where in the past. She tells us about her family. Her husband is Roger, Jack is the boy, and their baby Sarah. They also have a dog named Snowy. She asks who we are, but we decide it's best to use the key and tell Joral what happened. So we return to the present. We fill him in and he tells us he studied the notes and found out that we can choose what part of the pass to go to by rubbing different parts of the key. We head back and go to rub the key. Oh! Hey. <laughs> we go to pass A and talk to Jack. He says he's practicing to be a big and powerful druid. He's trying to light this fire using the rare and powerful runes he's found. They were given to him by a druid named Miselionar. He's going to create chocolate cakes when he's all powerful and make it rain strawberry flavored milk and conjure birds that will fly him all around the world. We use the key to go to pass B. This seems to be a few decades forward. Jack is an adult, Laura is old, and oh, oh man. We talk to Jack and ask him some questions. He says he's about to go on a journey and he's in a hurry. We tell him we'll read his mind instead. We tell him everything his childhood self told us. After demonstrating our powers of seeing into the past, he asks us to find out why the fruit trees his mother planted never grew. We go back to the past and dig up all the trees and replant them. We return to past B and see all the trees have grown. We talk to the now adult Sarah and she says these trees have never had issues growing. We tell Jack we did as he asked, but he says he has no idea what we're talking about. But now he's not in a hurry, so he's happy to tell us about the history of runes. He says that druids discovered them. They were created by Guthix himself. The world was named RuneScape, since they were so plentiful. People have started to create spellbooks using them, and some druids have been redubbed as wizards. We go back to Pass A and talk with Roger. He says he can't find what's wrong with his daughter, and he just wishes he could talk with her. We go to the grown-up Sarah in Pass B and talk to her. She has a nasty cough. She drinks a medicine and sounds much better. She says it's made of milk, honey, and guam. We go back to Pass A and make the medicine, and give it to the baby Sarah. We ask Roger to tell us how their family got here. They came from another plane of existence. In fact, they were the first humans on RuneScape. We go again to Pass B and talk to the old Laura. She says she spent her entire life looking after her family and just wishes she took some time to see the world. She says she was too worried she'd leave and never find her way back. We go back to Pass A and make a crude map of RuneScape using charcoal. We give it to Laura and we return to Pass B and she says she's lived a life with only a single regret. She says she lost a family brooch in her travels. We go to Pass A, find the brooch by her bedside and steal it, burying it in the ground by the shed. We dig it up in Pass B and give it back to her. We ask her about the history of this world. She says that they met Guthix, the god that introduced Introduced humans to RuneScape, although he didn't create them. She knew he was immensely powerful and took on his human form to not scare them. We ask about Sarah Doman and Zamorak. She says Guthix is the only one she's met, but she's rarely seen him since, as he doesn't want to upset the balance of the world. He encouraged them to live in harmony with their surroundings. He also warned them to not abuse the environment, and that he had not created RuneScape. He spoke of elder gods that existed in a time before even he could remember. He also told them about short folks of varying kinds, but nobody has seen them as of yet. We return to Joral and tell him everything we learned. Quest complete. Quest number 143. All fired up. 
We entered the throne room of the Missalan Castle and speak with King Rold. He says he's concerned about the threat of both Mauritania and the wilderness. He says the surrounding kingdoms have decided to join together against any attack from them. They have a beacon network set up all the way up the River Salve and to the deepest corner of the wilderness. They're to be used to warn of any attacks quicker than a messenger can travel. He asks us to test the network for him by lighting the beacons ourselves. He sends us to Blaze Sharp Eye, the head fire tender. He's stationed at the beacon near Paterdomus. We meet Blaze there and he tells us there is a total of 14 beacons, and they've worked out that in an emergency, they'll light the fires using gnomish fire lighters to change their colors, but for testing, only normal fires will be used. He asks us to test a few of them to make sure they're visible to the nearby beacons. Simply put 20 logs into a beacon and light it. He tells us to go to the next closest beacon in the limestone quarry. We head there and speak to the fire tender, Squire Fire. She confirms she can see the beacon. We light this one as well and return to Blaze. He confirms he can see the limestone beacon as well. He mentions this beacon has started to die down and asks us to rekindle it with five more logs. He tells us that's all he needed for now, but they'd like to do some more serious testing soon. He says he needs someone to light all 14 beacons and keep them lit simultaneously. He says the king is prepared to reward anyone who can complete this task very handsomely. We return to the king and he rewards us with 20,000 gold. Quest complete. Quest number 144, Summer's End. We can't just leave Summer and her family to their fate. We return to her and she tells us we have to come with her quickly. We follow her to her farm and enter the spirit realm. All the spirits are there to greet us, but we're not really at the farm. Eric begins explaining their history. 400 years ago, they all moved from Varrock to start a life of farming. Jenica died a year before the rest of them from spider poisoning. The rest of them died from the murderers, except for someone named Gargon. He was one of the farmhands, but he was away on an errand when they were attacked. They've been subjugated as cattle by the beast ever since. Jelek believes the beast used to devour souls outright, but something happened causing the veil between the worlds to shift, forcing the beast to instead draw substance slowly. It began trying to claw its way through the veil. Over the 400 years, it's made considerable progress, but our action caused it to create a tear, which is the ground shake we felt. Currently, we're in a part of the Void, the realm between realms of nothingness. Even less stable than the Abyss, it's a world of nothingness created by the beast's violent crashing through the Abyss. Marinic says they have a plan to stop the beast. First, we need to lure it into a cave they have prepared north of the farm. We have to keep the bait new, though. We can't lure it with anything we used last time, not even something remotely similar. We head to the cave and summon an iron bull, which uses a blue charm, and it seems to follow it. The problem is the cave is collapsed. We go back to the corporeal realm and enter the cave. Just inside is a skeleton. We loot it. It has a spade, tinderbox, axe, and pickaxe. We use the pickaxe to collapse the cave entrance. We managed to lure the beast into the new open cave entrance. Marinek explains the next part of the plan. The roots in the cave are cursed. When they burn, he believes the beast will confuse the fire for a soul, drawing it towards the fire. He says the beast's weakness is a core of soul energy in its chest. When it tries to eat the fire, it will be surprised for long enough for Marinek to try and break through the beast's armor. We lure the beast to a safe spot, and then we chop away while out of its range. We light a fire, and the beast tries to eat it, causing it to recoil, and Marinek gets a stab at it. We do it twice more, and the armor protecting its chest shatters. It retreats deeper into the cave. Jalek meets us in there, and he explains the core of souls inside the beasts are actually still living, being slowly consumed from within, and horribly corrupted. He says it's basically another entity entirely living within the beast, a dark core of souls. We need to take advantage of the chest plate being broken. Jalek says they can cast some sort of weakening spell on it. He needs a clear shot of the beast's head, and can only do it when the core has been removed from its body. He says we've been somewhat devoured by the beast. Our soul is one of the strongest parts of the core currently. The core will try to return to us. Since it's corrupted so horribly, it can't do anything but hurt us. We need to lure it away without letting it touch us, and then dig a hole and bury it there. The beast will try and get the core back, and that's when Jalek will strike. The beast shoots dark energy blasts at us, and we dodge around the room. Then the core jumps out of its chest, trying to get to us. We lure it into a hole, and the beast goes to claim it back. Jalek casts his spell. We do this again, and the beast gets enraged, firing volley after volley of attack before finally the core is released again, and we trap it. The 
The third spell causes the beast to retreat to the end of the cave. We give chase and find the beast is cornered. The spirits meet us here. Eric tells us it's time we defeat it for good. Jalek says if the spells worked, we should now be able to do some direct harm to the beast's actual existence. It's a being of overwhelming pain and torment, so it must be taken down with divine wrath. That's where we come in. Our actions of saving Summer's soul were somehow important. The cave is where Gargon buried all the victims, and it's also where they buried Jinnika. There's a significant amount of spirit energy here. We need to bless the graves to restore the strength of their souls so they can use the holy power to strike. We need to bless the correct grave when the beast uses an attack in order for it to work. Since the beast is weakened, we are able to distinguish which soul it's using to attack with. Each soul will need to hit the beast once. We hit the first. Then the second, and eventually the third. The beast disappears, and Summer stands in front of us, thanking us for saving their souls. Eric collapses the cave as we leave, and they say they're finally free to die. Summer blesses her mother's ring and gives it back to us, allowing it to give us passage through even weak spirit portals. Marinette gives us his shield. He also mentions that a holy elixir was used to make it strong, along with some sigils to strengthen it further. However, during the beast attacks, Marinette lost all the parts to it. But maybe we can find them in the wilderness. Quest complete. 57 fire making. But wait, if everything we do in the spirit realm causes the opposite to happen in the real world, where did the beast in its core end up? Quest number 145, Defender of Verok. As of this recording, this was also the most recent quest released in Old School. We speak with Captain Roven in Verok Castle. He says he has a job for us. Zombies seem to be mobilizing in the wilderness, and instead of shambling around mindlessly like normal, they're organized, forming ranks. We need to find out what's going on. He summons his scout Hartwin, who reports that he saw them north of Verok by a creepy building surrounded by lava, near the Graveyard of Shadows. He saw the zombie ranks in front of a shadowy figure. Hartwin leads us to the graveyard, but there's just a few zombies here. He's able to find a bunch of tracks leading away from the graveyard. We track and follow the trail, finding a grubby key on the way. We eventually end up at the Chaos Altar. We find a trap door behind it and enter. We found the armed zombies. We run past them and find a balcony, peer over. There's three creatures below. One zombie, one gargoyle looking thing, and one larger skeletal man. The gargoyle calls to Zimmerigal. Hartwin recognizes the name as Zimmerigal the Majorat, ancient enemy of Iraq. Zimmerigal tells the gargoyle there are no side effects of the mist and one must be imbued with it in order to pass through the doors. The gargoyle tells him Lucian is going quite strong and recommends they combine forces. Lucian is the one we stopped from getting the Staff of Armadale many, many years ago. What does he have to do with Zimmerigal? While I appreciate that we should keep good diplomatic relations with Lucian, there is such a thing as going too far. Combining forces is a bad plan. My lord. I won't hear of it. Lucian would likely want to lead in such an arrangement, and I have no desire to serve at his behest. Besides, I have significantly powerful resources of my own. After many long years, it is time for Arav to take command of my zombie troops. Arav? Like Shield of Arav? Hero of Avaraka? A fourth being comes into the room. Hartwin recognizes him clearly as Arav, the greatest hero of the Fourth Age. Zimrigal tells Arav and his gargoyle Shathrik, Sharath... Sharath Tirk. Zimrigal tells Arav and his gargoyle Sharath Tirk to inspect the troops. We kill some nearby zombies and the mist Sharath Tirk was talking about pours out of them. We fill them into some bottles we found on the ground and are able to use them to proceed through the gates. Arav is on the other side of the gate and he tells us we need to leave. It's too dangerous for us. We ask if he's somehow fighting Zimmerigal's control. He tells us that his mind is still intact and sometimes is able to speak freely if Zimmerigal is focusing in other places, but his body is no longer his. He's forced to see and feel every horrible thing Zimmerigal makes him do. We ask if we can help, but before he can answer, Zimmerigal summons him away. We fill three more bottles and continue, and we peer over another balcony and see the two looking over ranks of zombies. I'm telling you, he may be close to finding it. Enough! I don't have time to worry about fairy tales. The ritual approaches and we must be prepared. This may be our last real chance before the time comes to head north. We will make our attack on Varak as soon as possible. I will claim the shield of Arad. Hartwig gives us a teleport tablet and we use it to return to Varrock. We tell Captain Robin about the imminent danger. Hartwin says we should use the shield just like the son of the founder of Varrock did against Zimmerigal, the last time he attacked. 
Hartwin says the Encanto Dwarves know the secrets of the shield, but he doesn't know if they still exist. We tell him about Thurgo, and he asks us to go see if we can learn how to use the shield from him. We go to Thurgo's hut and ask him about the shield. He says he knows of it, but not how to use it. He says we can go to Kamdozal, a great hall underneath Ice Mountain that used to belong to the Encanto Dwarves. It was lost when the Barbarian Invasion happened generations ago. There was a sacred forge there, and their sages would peer into it to divine information. It was powered with the Blurite found in the caves near here. He writes down where the entrance should be located on a piece of paper. We head down into the caves and mine a piece of Blurite. We follow his coordinates and dig near the white tree on top of the mountain, and break into a cave below. There's a bed here. It looks like someone's been down here recently. We find a dwarf with a blindfold on, and what I assume is the Sacred Forge. We speak to the dwarf, and he says he's been down here for many years. He's a survivor of the Barbarian Invasion, and in Camdo, Sage, Guardian of the Sacred Forge. We ask why he's blindfolded. He says he was blinded in the cave-ins. We tell him we need to use the forge and why we need it. He allows it, and we put the blur out into the furnace. He chants over it and completes a sort of ritual dance. He tells us to look deep into the forge and visualize the shield. We see Roald. We ask what he's doing here. He responds that he's just our mind rationalizing the information we're getting from the forge. The king starts explaining the story of the shield of Arav and then is replaced with the queen. Whoa! I've never seen that NPC model before. She says that Arav didn't actually use the shield. The son of the founder of Varrock did. Sir Pryson says only the founder of Varrock's kin can use the shield's power. Of the seven elders of Varrock, only one of them was of the founding bloodline. What's this I found? Now this is interesting. A snooping adventurer. You pathetic human wretch. You have taken too long to discover what needs to be done. My zombie army is at the walls of Varak, even as we speak. We rush back to Varak, and sure enough, the castle is being overrun with zombies. One of which breaks the camera. We rush to Rogan, and he gives us the shield. We go to Reldo and tell him we need to find out if any of the blood relatives of the Founder are still here. He points us to a list of elders, along with the Varak census. We start talking to the people mentioned with similar names, beginning with Rold. Nothing happens when he holds it. Next we try his advisor, same thing. Sir Pryson, same thing. We head to the museum and talk to the curator. He says his great-grandfather was adopted into the Halen family. He says one of his ancestors actually married into the Fitzharmon family. We head to Dementheus Fitzharmon and have him try. The shield radiates with energy as he holds it. Dementheus takes the shield and destroys the invaders. It's all gone wrong! Aurof, get out of there! What do we do now? Regardless of this disaster, it is about time for me to head north. Quest complete. Quest number 146, swept away. North of Drainer Village, we find an interesting caravan with undead cattle and a pungent cauldron. We talk with the witch, Maggie, and she says she's brewing up a mean batch of the good stuff. She says it's not easy to make and needs some sort of the old razzle-dazzle, a sort of enchantment or witchy charm. Her cow over there named Babe has the sniffles. We can hear it over there sneezing. We offer to help, and she says the only thing left needed is to stir the brew with an enchanted broomstick. She has a broom, it's just not enchanted. She says this will need the help of a bunch of good witches, namely Hetty, Betty, and Aggie. We bring the broom to Betty, and she says she'll be happy to help. She says she'll need her wand, though, and it's locked in a chest in the cellar. It's sealed by magic. We head down and speak to Lottie, her apprentice. She tells us the chest won't open until order is brought to Betty's menagerie. We need to return all these animals to the correct pins, and we have to do so by only carrying one at a time, and we also can't carry them through a chamber that already has an animal in the cage. She also says the bat and snail are already where they need to be, so we can just focus on the other four. We easily solve the puzzle, and open the chest. We give the one to Betty, and she enchants the broom. Next we go to Hetty, and she tells us she'll prepare her famous broom ointment. She says first she needs a newt. She's got a delivery of them, and they're in the cellar. We go down there and find the delivery ghoul is still here. Apparently the labels got mixed up. Each label is wrong. But we're a genius though, and we can figure out that by taking this single toad from the one labeled both newts and toads, that this one has to be toads, this one has to be both, and this one has to be newts. We give one to Hetty, and she makes the ointment. We add it to the broom. Next, Aggie teleports us to a secret area that witches use. She's prepared a pattern of 16 lines in sand. To enchant the broom, we need to sweep away exactly four lines to leave four small triangles and nothing else. Once again, genius us solved this puzzle in record time. We head back to Maggie, and she has us stir the cauldron. 
She thanks us for helping her make her goulash. Uh, uh, that's just food. She also says we can help ourselves to ten bowls full. Quest complete. Before we head out, we talked to the purple cat nearby. It says that it wasn't always that color, but Wendy did some playing around. We ask her about it. She says she can make cats purple. We ask her if she can make Leia purple. She says she can, but she's out of magic unguit, which she needs for the spell. We ask her to get some, and she says Lottie would know. We go back to Betty's cellar and talk with Lottie. She says the unguit is in the chest, but Betty scrambled the animals since we had such an easy time getting into the chest the first time. It was easy this time, too. We return the Ungent to Maggie, and she dyes Leia purple. Mini quest complete. So the next full episode is probably going to be pretty big. You'll end up tormented if you'll miss it. Claw that subscribe button to make sure you don't. Hey, thanks so much for making it all the way to the end. See you soon.